God has made us to sit with Christ in the heavenly places, and every Christian must begin his spiritual life from that place of rest. In the second part, we select the word walk as expressive of our life in the world, which is its subject. We are challenged there to display in our Christian walk conduct that is in keeping with our high calling. And finally, the third part, we find the key to our attitude toward the enemy contained in the word stand expressive of our place of triumph at the end. Thus we have key words in Ephesians. One, our position in Christ, sit, based on Ephesians 2.6. Two, our life in the world, walk, on Ephesians 4.1. And our attitude towards the enemy, three, stand, based on Ephesians 6.11. Number one, sit. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ raised him from the dead, and made him to sit at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Ephesians 1, 17-21 And raised us with him, and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace have ye been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the, the gift of God, not of works, that no man should glory. Ephesians 2, 6 through 9. Christianity does not begin with walking, it begins with sitting. The Christian era began with Christ, of whom we are told that when he had made purification of sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1, 3. With equal truth, we can say that the individual Christian life begins with a man in Christ. That is to say, when by faith we see ourselves seated together with him in the heavens. Most Christians make the mistake of trying to walk in order to be able to sit. But that is a reversal of the true order. Our natural reason says, if we do not walk, how can we ever reach the goal? What can we attain without effort? How can we ever get anywhere if we do not move? But Christianity is a queer business. If at the outset we try to do anything, we get nothing. If we seek to attain something, we miss everything. For Christianity begins not with a big do, but with a big done. Thus, Ephesians opens with the statement that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. And we are invited at the very outset to sit down and enjoy what God has done for us, not to set out to try and attain it for ourselves. We, what does it really mean to sit down? When we walk or stand, we bear on our legs all the weight of our own body. But when we sit down, our entire weight rests upon the chair or the couch on which we sit. We grow weary when we walk or stand but we feel rested when we have sat down for a while. In walking or standing, we expend a great deal of energy, but when we are seated, we relax at once, because the strain no longer falls upon our muscles and nerves, but upon something outside ourselves. So also in the spiritual realm, to sit down is simply to rest our whole weight, our load, ourselves, our future, everything upon the Lord. We let him bear responsibility and cease to carry it ourselves. In the creation, God worked from the first to the sixth day and rested on the seventh. We may truthfully say that for these six days, he was very busy. Then the task he had set himself completed. He ceased to work. The seventh day became the Sabbath of God. It was God's rest. But what about Adam? Where did he stand in relation to that rest of God? Adam, we are told, was created on the sixth day. Clearly then, he had no part in those first six days of work, for he came into being only at their end. God's seventh day was, in fact, Adam's first day. Whereas God worked six days and then enjoyed his Sabbath rest, Adam began his life with the Sabbath. For God works before he rests, while man must first enter into God's rest, and then alone can he work. 
It was because God's work of creation was truly complete that Adam's life could begin with rest. Our key word here is not, of course, in its context, a command to sit down, but to see ourselves as seated in Christ. Paul prays that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened, Ephesians 1.18, to understand all that is contained for us in this double fact, that God has first by mighty power made him to sit, and then by grace made us to sit with him. And the first lesson we must learn is this, that the work is not initially ours at all, but his. It is not that we work for God, but that he works for us. God gives us our position of rest. He brings his son's finished work and presents it to us. And then he says to us, please sit down. His offer to us cannot, I think, be better expressed than in the words of the invitation to the great banquet. Come, for all things are now ready. Luke 14, 17. Our Christian life begins with the discovery of what God has provided. Every new spiritual experience begins with an acceptance by faith of what God has done. With a new sitting down, if you like. Think again. How did we receive the forgiveness of our sins? Paul tells us that it was according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1, 7. And that this was freely bestowed on us in the Beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. We did nothing to merit it. We have our redemption through his blood, that is, on the ground of what he has done. What then is God's basis for the outpouring of the Spirit? It is the exaltation of the Lord Jesus, Acts 2.33. Because Jesus died on the cross, my sins are forgiven. Because he is exalted to the throne, I am endued with power from on high. The one gift is no more dependent than the other upon what I am or what I do. I did not merit forgiveness, and neither do I merit the gift of the Spirit. I received everything, not by walking, but by sitting down. Not by doing, but by resting in the Lord. Ephesians sets forth what is. It starts with Jesus Christ and with the fact that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. When the Holy Spirit shows us Christ and we believe on him, then at once we are no further act on our part. There begins for us a life in union with him. How can we know present deliverance from sin's reign? How is our old man who has followed us and troubled us for years to be crucified and put away? Once again, the secret is not in walking, but in sitting. Not in doing, but in resting in something done. We died to sin. We were baptized into his death. We were buried with him. God made us alive together with Christ. Romans 6, 2-4 and Ephesians 2, 5. Of him, God, are ye in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. He that establishes us with you in Christ is God. 2 Corinthians 1, 21. All the experiences he met, we too have met in him. Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away that so we should no longer be in bondage to sin, Romans 6.6. 6. Our deliverance from sin is based not on what we can do, not even on what God is going to do for us, but on what he has already done for us in Christ. When that fact dawns upon us and we rest back upon it, Romans 6.11, then we have found the secret of a holy life. The secret of deliverance from sin is not to do something, but to rest on what God has done. God is waiting for your store of strength to be utterly exhausted before he can deliver you. Once you have ceased to struggle, he will do everything. God is waiting for you to despair. Of all the parables in the Gospels, that of the prodigal son affords, I think, the supreme illustration of the way to please God. The Father says in Luke 15.32, It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this young brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. 
In all these words, Jesus reveals what it is that, in the sphere of redemption, supremely rejoices his Father's heart. It is not an elder brother who toils incessantly for the Father, but a younger brother who lets the Father do everything for him. It is not an elder brother who always wants to be the giver, but a younger brother who is always willing to be the receiver. When the prodigal returned home, having wasted his substance in riotous living, the father had not a word of rebuke for the waste nor a word of inquiry regarding the substance. He did not sorrow over all that was spent. He only rejoiced over the opportunity the son's return afforded him for spending more. God is so wealthy that his chief delight is to give. His treasure stores are so full that it is painful to him when we refuse him an opportunity of lavishing those treasures upon us. It was the father's joy that he could find in the prodigal an applicant for the robe, the ring, the shoes, and the feast. It was his sorrow that in the elder son he found no such applicant. It is a grief to the heart of God when we try to provide things for him. He is so very, very rich. It gives him true joy when we just let him give and give and give again to us. It is a grief to him too when we try to do things for him, for he is so very, very able. He longs that we will just let him do and do and do. He wants to be the giver eternally. He wants to be the doer eternally. If only we saw how rich and how great he is, we would leave all the giving and all the doing to him. Do you think that it, if you cease trying to please God, your good behavior will cease? If you leave all the giving and all the working to God, do you think the result will be less satisfactory than if you do some of it? It is when we seek to do it ourselves that we place ourselves back again under the law. But the works of the law, even our best efforts, are dead works, hateful to God, because ineffectual. Just you stop giving, and you will prove what a giver God is. Stop working, and you will discover what a worker he is. The younger son was all wrong, but he came home, and he found rest. And that is where Christian life begins. God being rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, 4, and 6. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, Luke fifteen thirty two. This has been a reading of excerpts from a book by Watchman Nee called Sit, Walk, Stand. Next week we will continue reading some excerpts from the book and we will look at the walk section. If you'd like to join us, you can study the book of Ephesians, or you can find the Watchman Nee book on Kindle. And it's also available on YouTube if you do a, a search under Sit, Walk, Stand by Watchman Nee. But also there will be links in the description when this video is posted online. Thank you for joining us for this.